Welcome to the PDIA in Action series. My name is Salima Samji and I'm the Director of Building State Capability at the Harvard Center for International Development. I will be your moderator today. The format of today's session is as follows. I will begin with an overview of the event series followed by a presentation before we open for a question and answer session. Please feel free to put your questions or comments in the chat during the presentation. Matt Andrews and I co-teach MLD 103, a field lab class where students learn how to use the PDIA approach by working on real world problems. They learn by doing. The students work together in teams with an authorizer or client who gives them a problem to work on. This year, we asked the alumni of our Implementing Public Policy Executive Program to nominate problems for our students. Over a seven week period between January and March, our students worked with their authorizer to better understand the problem and to identify entry points. This event series showcases the learning of our students as well as our executive program alumni. Our topic for today's session is childcare in Burien, Washington. And with us, we have our student team, Crystal Collier, Doreen King, and Patty Chindapol. Welcome. The students worked with Kevin Schilling. He is the city councilor of Burien and an implementing public policy executive program alumni. I'd now like to invite Doreen to get us started. Doreen, over to you. Good morning. Sorry, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I will be speaking on behalf of the team getting started. And I just want to say that when Matt and Salima presented Kevin's problem to us initially, um, we spent a considerable amount of time, you know, both individually and as a team, um, in trying to understand and construct the problem, uh, realizing, of course, that the direction that we took will depend on how we view that problem, right? Um, so with time, our problem statement changed, it was refined, and we ultimately got to access to affordable and quality childcare in Burien. Um, and with that, we took into consideration the child, that childcare benefits are limited and restrictive, the systemic bar barriers that are in place that hinder people who most need these benefits, and the broader issues of social and economic impact on the communities because of this said deficit. Um, moving on to the next slide. So as we deconstructed the problem of accessing affordable uh, quality healthcare, we looked at several important barriers. Um, for example, we talked about affordability, eligibility, systemic racism, but ultimately we settled on awareness, lack of business support, and lack of city support as our entry points. And as you'll see in um, the next slide, where we actually constructed a very detailed fishbone diagram we really delved into the many potential underlying issues um, and causes for each of these barriers. For example, one of the ones that we landed on was one of the barriers to entry. Um, we, we, we talked about um, awareness um, and that ultimately became an entry point for us. And we looked at the fact that there were so many people who were, first of all, unaware of the current programs that were in place to assist them before we even looked at how to fix it, right? And how to make it better. We also talked about the fact that, you know, maybe they don't know where to find the information to be able to help them with this problem. Um, and, you know, as, as you can see, the, the, the fishbone diagram became quite complex, quite big, as we really delved into so many underlying issues. Um, and honestly, if we kept going at this, we probably could, could have kept going and kept building and, kept, and keep growing. But we wanted to really make it as concise based on what the problem was and the parameters that we were trying to address. So like I said, we focused on those three areas of awareness, lack of business support, and lack of city support. And if you move on to, next slide, Crystal. What did we learn from doing this? So first of all, this is a known problem. This is a global problem. This is a city problem. This is a state problem, right? Um, so it's, it's not a matter of trying to convince people that this is a problem. It is a known problem. But the issue is that the level of support varies depending on who you're talking to right? Um, why is this a problem? Why does this support vary? So first of all, we're talking about and looking at restrictive funding and limited resources that the city has. That's a big problem, right? Um, it's a huge problem. 
but there are other huge problems. So it's competing with big issues like housing and healthcare and so on. Um, and then the other issue that we found um, to be quite prevalent is the lack of coordination between the various actors, whether that be at the city level, um, at the level of the actual um, parents themselves, or the persons who are running the daycare centers and so on, there, there, there seem to be very limited coordinated effort between or amongst, I should say, those actors. And then, of course, there is the, 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 the question of what type of childcare is needed, depending on who you're dealing with, depending on you know, what the parent needs are for the child and the child's needs, that, that type of childcare will vary. So there are all these different things that came into play as we really delved into and, and deconstructed this problem. So what did we see as the way forward? How, did we, how are we going to approach this? So we thought that it made sense to really just jump into the problem in terms of identifying a variety of actors and getting to have those one-on-one -on -one conversations you know, with these persons within the communities. Uh, we started um, at the community level, talking to some of the, the, the childcare facilities, and that included facilities within Burien. And actually we, we stretched it to talk to childcare facilities in our own lo locales. Um, as you know, we are, you know, because of COVID, we are spread into different locations right now. Um, so for example, I would have spoken to persons within the New York area. Um, Crystal spoke to persons in, in, in the Boston area and so forth. Um, and, you know, as we, as we looked, as we delved into that, we noted that, you know, the, the, the differences in how they operate, right? And how important it was to build awareness of the problem for the different levels of actors so that each person that we thought should care about it actually cared about it. And how do we make them care about it? How do we make them see that this is an important problem, not just for the persons who are lacking childcare, but for everyone as a community, as a state, as a country, right? So in having those conversations that like we really got like very important information um, and guidance as to how to build that awareness and that support. And we also looked into things like subsidies, um, you know, how, how that impacted this problem, areas that we would not have necessarily had that much information on, but we, we you know, this, this kind of gleaned this new information for us. Um, so what we realized Having had these conversations and speaking to different actors and, 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 and Kevin himself um, is that th there was actually a lot of opportunity to explore partnerships, for example, with nonprofit or, uh, organizations to be able to raise this level of awareness and to be able to, to, to kind of formulate a pilot to get this done, right? Um, so that when it came time for Kevin to run with this and start, start working on it individually, separately from us, um, something would be in place in the sense of a pilot program for him to, 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 to have established who was going to be instrumental in actually helping him to move this thing forward, right? To get that train out of the station, so to speak. So that led us then to, next slide, Crystal. Um, as I've discussed before, those three areas that we looked at for entry points. So first of all, quick looking at awareness. Um, it's very important to know, first of all, what you don't know, um, what you need to know, and, and, and lastly, how to get that information to be able to move forward, right? And if people are unaware of the opportunities that are available for these programs, right, even like I said, prior to us working on this problem, how will that benefit them? If they don't know that there these things that are existing, even when the problem is fixed, they're still not gonna know. So how do we get this information to them, right? As a people who actually need it. Um, so we looked at that. And then the lack of city support. With the limited budget, as you can see, that $350,000 that allocated to the human services budget, um, we're talking about, that's actually a very, a relatively small budget if it's going to be split amongst something like this problem and other um, other areas right that fall under this category so what what do we do if this is going to be spread amongst all of these human services then how will this be prioritized right that becomes a separate conversation um, with all the uh, I guess what would be potential supporters down the line um, in terms of council members, et cetera, we have to get the, those persons on board to convince them that this is a big priority, one. And two, how do we expand that funding? Is there an opportunity to, to, to grow that, to make it more, have more available to this problem? And then lastly, the lack of business support. Like I said earlier, there's a huge opportunity for partnerships 
um, between for um, council members, between government and, and public citizens, um, as well as private partnerships. So not only in terms of bringing awareness to the problem, but in terms of getting funding and other types of support to actually tackle and address this problem. Um, and that's where um, things like, you know, PPP and, and CRA, et cetera, are gonna come in, which I'm gonna turn over to my colleagues um, for them to discuss shortly. Thank you. All right, thank you, Doreen, for a great introduction to the problem um, and some of the entry points that we've identified. Um, so for the first entry point, as Doreen mentioned, that is awareness. Uh, some ideas that we thought about uh, to accelerate the awareness within the community is first to work towards forming a network of different stakeholders from community organizations to employers to child care providers that will act as a, a group that can help us bridge the information gap between the city and families on the ground. Uh, the second is to set a stage for developing a communication or engagement strategy for the different types of audiences that Doreen mentioned, um, because child care is a problem for some people and for others it is a problem, maybe it's more of a condition that we have to raise urgency on. So we need to make this uh, the strategy something that can be tailored to all different kinds of audiences. So what we've tried, uh, we've tried, well, Doreen has tried simulating the experience for navigating the subsidy application system herself to figure out where the pain points are as a user. Um, so that was one area of like trying to figure out, well, how do you start the process even. The second is to make initial contact with some of the community organizations that are listed on the slide here um, to understand the context that we're operating in, as well as the resources that are already available to the families, compiling research on the wide ranging impacts of uh, access to child care, standard desk review, but very important because that will form some of the content that will go into the communication strategy or the communication itself. Um, and the last one is developing a network map. And we do have this ma network map somewhere um, that uh, we've mapped out some of the stakeholders and the important players that we can leverage in this whole um, community. And so from all of these ideas, we've listed out some leads on the next slide. Uh, the first one is to create a coalition within the community of individuals who are trained to advocate for themselves and their communities, and to think about childcare as a, from a systems thinking perspective. That is because childcare is relevant to everyone, just how does the community itself uh, build the capacity of the individuals to really mobilize uh, all sorts of community members for this cause. The second and third points are thinking about things that could go into that communication with families, with uh, organizations, employers, and so on. The second point is mining the Child Care Collaborative Task Force 2020 legislative, legislative report for information. That's more on the technical side, the economic impacts, why you should care from like the larger uh, community like perspective, but also the third point comes in with some of the more humanizing stories because childcare impact is not just about how much money you're losing, but also you can move people based on the individual stories. And that's where collaborating with Child Care Resources CEO, Phoebe Anderson comes in. Um, the fourth and fifth point has to do with uh, how do we get the story out there? The fourth point is collaborating with council member Sydney Moore uh, to coordinate this child care awareness campaign. Uh, council member Moore has a lot of experience in terms of media and marketing and grassroots community mobilizing and engagement. The uh, fifth point is with Colleen, who's the human services manager of city of Burien, and that is more to work on disseminating information to a specific audience to the nonprofit partners. The second entry point is city support. We've also identified two ideas. So, uh, the city of Burien is a majority uh, minority city, which means that the services cater to these uh, populations should be in all sorts of different languages that will serve the different populations. That's why we recommend that the first point on ensuring that uh, the services and the facilities are offered in multiple first languages. The second point is what Doreen mentioned earlier, the funding is quite limited and how do we make childcare a priority on that funding list. 
So we tried to learn more about this issue as well by talking to various administrative authorities. We mentioned Colleen earlier um, to kind of learn more about the technical feasibility side, but we've also kind of gauged the political feasibility, the space for us to kind of build on in terms of uh, the city council members. So we've talked to a number of them, uh, city council members as well. And then we've also spoken to local authorities in other areas like Boston um, and other cities that may have different systems going on just to learn about uh, what is there to learn from. And we've also identified Kent and Bellevue as uh, comparable cities. Um, all right. And so Oops, <laughs> there you go. In terms of leads, um, there are five points again. And the first one is to develop a one pager. And that one pager will consist of important information on what why child care matters. It can be used in all sorts of different engagements. It's not meant to go into detail, but as a conversation starter to give folks a basic idea, for example, in terms of city council members or engaging other people who are in decision-making positions. The second point is addressing siloed thinking within government structures. It's been expressed that government uh, officials and departments tend to work in silos, and so they don't talk about each other. But as we've mentioned quite a few times, child care is a problem for the community as a whole in different departments, different areas, different aspects. So how do we uh, tear down those walls? The third point is to coordinate advocacy um, and to build pressure onto decision makers to make this a priority. Um, and then the fifth point links in with that to continue building commitment because commitment is something we build but also revisit and continue to build. And the fourth point is to learn from the two cities that we've identified as comparable. Over to Crystal. Okay, so this was the third entry point that we actually identified. And when we were thinking about the entry points, one of the things that we, you know, we talked about in class and thought about it from the model is, um, what is the problem that you're talking about? You know, who does this matter to? Um, why does it matter? And really the question of who does it need to matter more about? And this is when you get to the business support, this is really one of those areas about where it needs to matter more because when you think about Burien as a community, um, that the business is an essential part of how this is going to work and you know uh, the economic driver to really think about um, how do we make childcare affordable because it does impact not just, it impacts the business bottom line, their workers, their own um, sense of well being uh, and support. So, when we we're looking at um, thinking about from ways to address or accelerate business support, uh, there was a lot of work in thinking around and research around uh, corporate social responsibility and public private partnership models that we could look at, and also thinking about uh, corporate re the Corporate Reinvestment Act dollars. So it's thinking about what are some models that are out there that have been successful that could be adapted to Burien. Um, how can you look to pull your child care investment um, funds uh, and thinking about how they can be managed jointly uh, between business community representatives and the city administration. Again, when you think about the size of the human services budget for Burien, $350,000 um, with competing priorities even if this was the prior priority is not necessarily going to go a long way. So there really are ways in thinking about how do how does this get funded and how can you look to the business community um, to do that? And then also thinking about what other partnerships are available for creating more um, child care resources and um, in, 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 a, in and of itself. So really thinking about how do you provide in-house child care services. And that was really looking at and thinking broadly around some of the larger employers in the community. Uh, some of the things that we talked about um, and tried to learn through our process to understand this, where we engaged with people who actually think who actually create navigation networks. So that was Kinside about how people can connect and understand um, where childcare resources is, so referral sources, um, as well as managing the payment. So if the, when we started this conversation with Kevin, where we actually started it was the idea of a subsidy and looking at it, even thinking about it as a, a tax credit that we're getting or looking at it as a flexible spending account. So when talking with Kinside, part of that was 
understanding how one would manage a flexible uh, spending account or a childcare dependency account. We also were able to make contact with uh, the person who heads the Southside uh, Chamber of Com Commerce. And one of the things also thinking about businesses is really thinking about how do you consolidate back end functions for some of the smaller child care providers and what businesses can support some of that administrative functions and learn that there are things within uh you know, membership does matter when you're part of the Chamber of Commerce where there were additional supports that could be added. So learning that, just developing um, research and better understanding of the CRS and PPP models, and then just really thinking about potential corporate uh, partners. Uh, hmm. I want to let me go. Okay, so for business support, these are some of the opportunities. So actually, it was to create a network map to understand the different channels um, and opportunities that existed, and that one was actually started during this process. You want to be able to have this conversation with business. So why is this important to them? Why should it matter to them? So similar to what was discussed in the previous slide about a one pager, it's really how do we help people understand childcare and how it is important to business, not from what, just what you're hearing in the news or in some of the national debates. Why do they need to understand it? So a way to actually break that down so they can see the bottom line. And when we talked to uh, Andrea from the Chamber of Commerce, there was we understood that there was like a basic understanding, but it didn't really go to the wheat. So how do you actually go dive deeper so you can actually generate some more support? Um, this is to work with the Chamber of Commerce, as I previously mentioned, to think about what type of technical assistance can be provided to local child care providers. The majority of child care providers in um, Burien are really your in-house. So it's not large center base, but these are in-house um, and smaller child care providers in particular communities. So how do you bring those without and that actually allow for diverse, culturally appropriate care um, with trusted with, with someone who looks like them and looks like their children. So instead of trying to, um, to centralize it in such a way, how do you actually provide support, centralize the back end services so people are able to work and maintain the community? Um, thinking about leveraging community resources, this was one thing that we were talked to. Um, and it was a quote that stuck with us. There's not a lot of money in state government, but there's plenty of money in the state. So you do have some large companies um, in the state that could provide some opportunities to think about how do you partner? Um, Amazon, Costco, Boeing, Microsoft. I know that there's some issue with Microsoft currently in terms of some personal things, but still they're an opportunity to reach out. Uh, the other piece is how do you outreach to larger employees? So a St. Anne's Hospital thinking about where uh, the majority of where you get a uh, critical mass of people who reside in Burien and where they're working and how do you actually move childcare in a way that's convenient to them and works for them. Um, and just thinking about established partnerships. Um, so when we were doing this process, there were still some other things and other questions that we had um, that we were leaving Kevin, because we did have a short engagement, so we were leaving Kevin with um, to build and to grow on. So this was thinking about the broader implications of working with businesses, just to really try to understand more what the impacts can be. Uh, looking at a multifaceted approach to engage with the community um, child care providers and uh, recipients of the service to really understand what it is that they need instead of doing for them, doing with them. So you can make sure that any action that ultimately is taken is well-intentioned and aligned to the needs of the community. Um, really trying to get a handle on what business support could look like. So you actually have something that you're pitching to the community and some of these business leaders, as opposed to spitballing like, hey, you could do this. The way it, it spends a lot of time that might not be most uh, appropriate. Uh, thinking about child, what support means, and we have that in quotes, because who doesn't support childcare? Uh, well, there may be some 
exa examples of that in the news today, but still, um, who doesn't really support childcare? Who's gonna actually say that it's a bad thing, but how do you translate that support into tangible action? And really being able to get concrete with people so you actually explore what's gonna have to, what may be some of the sacrifices and how do you actually move forward? And then there was a bigger question just in terms of the way childcare is funded right now. And it's trying to understand what is the appropriate funding baseline to actually determine who is eligible for subsidies and the level of support that they're able to receive. Uh, so these are just some of the lessons that we learned working as a team. Um, yeah, everybody has their own angle. So we all come to this with different um, priorities, different interests. So it was really helpful to be able to allow people to explore those things, but then to come together to see how it allowed us to move forward um, as to being prescriptive. Um, the importance of revisiting the problem statement. So it is an iterative process. How are we really understanding what the problem is so we can understand better the entry points and our opportunities for change? Uh, the other piece is thinking about the agreements you're making as a team, just to make sure that everybody is on the same page uh, in terms of how you're moving forward and to make adjustments so you don't get stuck in really technical procedural pieces, but you're able to continue to grow in the work. The other piece is constant and frequent communication. The opportunity to do this, and this will actually lead into something that we learned thinking about PDA in general, is that it's really important to communicate and maintain a regular set of communication. And it doesn't actually have to be a long communication, but just so you're always staying in tune with each other. When we didn't know what the other was doing, it led to we weren't able to move as quickly. Um, and then it's really one of the things, and T Kevin, obviously a key part of the team is listening is really, really important. Um, listening and trying to understand, um, listening, um, listening and not talking, uh, a really generative uh, type of listening. So you're able to really build and create community in the group so you can actually move forward. Uh, and these are some of the lessons that we learned overall in doing PDIA. Um, every conversation, no matter how small, that we took outside of our group and team meetings led to a different place. When our, our, it took our group conversations to a different level. So you can't really minimize the opportunity of people leaving your team meetings and going out, doing some own, doing the constant learning and growing and looking for information each week. Um, bigger is not always better. Uh, and, and the small steps, I think sometimes where people could get held up is that the problem becomes so big, it's so overwhelming. It's, therefore the solutions have to be big and so, and that becomes overwhelming and can stall a process. So for us, it was really coming to appreciate really the small steps. So a conversation with the head of the Chamber of Commerce was great because we learned some things about things that are currently existing within the Chamber of Commerce that might actually prove to be something that can be built on and grown. And we had multiple opportunities of those types of conversations to happen. Um, understanding the AAA analysis, so thinking about authority, acceptance, and I am always landing on that last one that's going to fail me. Somebody chime in. I have authority acceptance. Ability. Anybody? Thank you. Um, is thinking around um, and understanding the change space and really thinking about how do you grow because it becomes a different conversation. So understanding what authority Kevin actually held in a circumstance really helped to us identify what work it is. So if we had come up with some idea for him to take on, but he didn't really necessarily have the authority to do, and we're just like, go ahead and do that. So go ahead and start this fund. But he doesn't necessarily hold the authority to be able to do that. We missed several steps. So being able to understand that better actually allowed us to take smaller steps that could really move to the opportunity of, to the larger goal of addressing the issue of childcare. Um, understanding the distinction between the, uh, between a condition and a problem, those conditions. And honestly, as uh, Doreen started this conversation talking about childcare, that it's a problem everywhere. It's not a new issue. It is not a, um, 
it is not something that people haven't been talking about for decades. That's because it's a condition that people actually got comfortable with. It was gonna be a problem that we couldn't necessarily do anything about. But thinking about it and understanding what the problem is in a smaller, more targeted way, actually hopefully will help Kevin move forward in actually coming up with a solution for um, Burien. Um, growing the change spaces, taking action. Um, don't reinvent the wheel. A lot of it is, is what you learn and how do you grow. Um, keeping an open mind and and acknowledging. So when you go in with kind of a, a growth mindset and you're open, things become clear and you can actually see cogs turning. Um, and I think our last piece was that PDA is not meant to be taken, un, uh, taken an undertaken alone. It's like your team is important. Um, the, the communication between the, the stronger you are, the more um, likely that you would have uh, be successful in your work. And um, that's all for us. Wonderful, thank you very much. I'd now like to invite Kevin Schilling, who is a city councilor in Burien and who worked with our students to share some of his thoughts. Kevin, over to you. Hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to be back once again. Um, it's wonderful to be here and to see and to see the team uh, all together again um, after so much time apart. Um, I caught a, a good amount of that, and I'm I'm happy to say that what was said by Crystal there is still true. I am one of seven council members, and I can make a decent chunk of an impact a uh, certain amounts of time. Since this project has wrapped up or since the team has wrapped up with me, I have in fact been pretty successful at uh, navigating the landscape, childcare landscape and sort of intervening in areas where at first I wouldn't have thought I'd been able to intervene. So for example, there's two places that um, the team really helped me understand where um, I could make a, a big impact. One is sort of in the economic development realm. And since the team has worked with, um, has worked with me, I've gotten childcare as a regional priority for the private public partnership economic development uh, organization called Greater Seattle Partners. Um, and it's, it's hilarious because the, the director of that was like, all right, so this is, this is what we're doing now, but what are we supposed to do? <laughs> I was like, well, we got to figure it out. Um, and I've, I've, I've since also um, just had a little bit more, a little bit more gumption, I'd say, to go into spaces and say, I want you as a partner. I want you as a teammate. I want us to figure this out together. And so talking with the unions that do childcare work, talking with the state offices that do childcare work, sort of positioning ourselves as a city to prepare for the influx of federal money that's going to be coming for childcare. This is, this is where the PDIA team was really helpful um, and that we worked together well on sort of understanding and figuring out this space together. Um, the, the PDIA team it was so funny because they would go and they would have meetings with regional people or, or organizations and then I'd follow up and they'd be like oh yeah your, your Harvard team or oh yeah the Kennedy school <laughs> so like I like to joke that they became a force of their own in Burien. and I was just like go do what you need to do go talk to whoever you need to talk to use my name if you need to use my name and you know what as as um as Salima and Matt often will say like this is work that uh you know it might it might push some boundaries it might it might ruffle some feathers and Certainly when you're saying, you know, there's work that needs to be done that hasn't been done and there's needs that need to be addressed. A lot of people take that as, oh, well, you're telling me the work I'm doing isn't enough. And that's not the case, right? Like PDIA is all about trying to find ways to implement better and do things more efficiently and effectively and to learn from it. And one thing after I've worked with the uh, HKS team is like, there is so much aversion to wanting to learn from doing. It's, and, and this was like one of the first lectures from the PDIA program that I did was uh, you have to be able to learn and go back and try again. You can't just try to make it perfect at the beginning. It's not gonna be. Um, and so that's something I've learned significantly from this group and significantly from this work, but we're moving forward. We're in, we're in the regional economic development um, uh, plan. We are working with the Aspen Institute to develop a city-based um, city option for childcare. Like these things are happening and we're learning a lot, right? Like I, after working with the team and finding out what I'm able to do at the city, but also regionally, oh my goodness, there is, there is, 
so much that has changed since I've worked with the Harvard team pretty much because I've learned so many new things and different avenues to take advantage of. So um, that, that is just, that's pretty much what I wanted to say. Uh, if there's, if there's questions or, or anything, I am happy to take them. Great. Thank you very much, Kevin. I'd now like to invite uh, Matt Andrews to share some words. Matt, over to you. So, uh, I, I mean, my first comment is just, it's it's so powerful how talking to people, and I think I've got a funny line over my face. Um, uh, it's so powerful to me how talking to people teaches you things. And I think um, there's so much that was learned in this by just engaging with people and having them engage with each other. Um, and, you know, in, in a sense, to me, the PDIA process just brings people together um to create some synergies that were all always there just waiting to happen um and i think you know even one of the findings was that you know this idea that there is money there and there are people who are willing to engage and there are partnerships that that can be be struck um but sometimes we just aren't looking in those places and we aren't thinking and it isn't even to me about thinking outside of the box it's really just about having conversations it's just about talking to people and listening to those people. And I think I think it was uh, um, Doreen or Crystal mentioned that right at the beginning. Listening is so important. And, you know, just for the team and for Kevin, the amount of listening that you did, the amount of talking, the amount of engagement, um, you know, thank you. Thank you all for 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 giving over to giving yourselves over to this process. Um, but I think it's really come to a useful and an interesting place. And um, yeah, I, I think uh, it, it, it really is an incredible thing to see how much latent know-how and knowledge there is always out there, but we just often leave it on the table because we just don't connect people. Um, it's a really interesting topic. I think one of the things that is, is, is particularly interesting to me is as you address this in Burian, given that one of the things I think you found is, you know, it seems like you started with the Burian issue, but you realized that it's not just a Burian issue, there's an issue in the state. And maybe some of the partners or potential partners you have are, are at the state level, not necessarily at the, the, the local government level. One of the things that is really fascinating to me is the potential that you have to take some of this work um, outside of Bury and, and kind of more into the state beyond this. So um, that was very exciting. Um, it was really great to work with the team, great to work with Kevin. Um, and I, I look forward to hopefully uh, engaging with all of you uh, in other contexts as well down the line. Great, thank you, Matt. And uh, we will now move to the Q&A session. And before we... Uh, get to any of you to ask your questions. I wanted to ask, uh, to start us off with a question. And I was wondering if each of you could answer the question, um, what surprised you the most in this process? Um, yeah. And, and Kevin, you also have to answer the question. So all four of you and I'll spotlight all of you so we can see the four of you. Uh, clarifying, what did we learn? What surprises about the question of childcare or about the PDIA process? The PDIA process. And it can also be about childcare. I see. Um, I, I, I'll start. I think what surprises me is somebody who is in a lots of meetings to talk about complex and, and um, complicated issues that the model of PDIA is definitely some, it, it's, it's in some ways it's not rocket science. Like, you know what I mean? Like it's like to understand the concept and it is a way that you can actually move a conversation forward um, that, that um, can fit into you know, a person's schedule who has so much to do and no one has time, but it's a way you can tailor it and make it fit. Um, and also the idea that really talking about small steps involve small victories and the power that that actually has um, in being able to move a problem, move something forward and to build momentum and um, energy in a group. So I, I think for me, um, I came into this course 
coming from a project management background, um, you know, having having spent a lot of time working in project management as a PMP. So I'm accustomed to getting things done in a certain way, looking more at chunks of information um, and at, you know, working with larger teams, everybody siloed off to do X, Y, Z, right? Talking about scope and time and cost and all these different things. So having to kind of step back and slow it down and take bite-sized chunks, you know, um, and to iterate and to constantly be moving on this smaller scale, but quickly was different for me. So it was like activating a completely different part of my brain, so to speak. Um, so I found that to be quite, quite interesting to be able to kind of shuffle between both areas. Um, very thankful for the opportunity to develop that skill. Um, and then secondly, is how willing persons actually were to have the conversations. Um, as someone mentioned, I think it was Patty that mentioned before, earlier on uh, when we started, I thought it made sense to kind of go through the process myself to see what persons encounter when they're trying to get this healthcare, this, this childcare assistance, right? Um, so I went through the process of calling up um, the agencies and asking the questions, like, you know, as if I were a person who's looking for, for childcare. And it was quite interesting how the conversations flowed. But then once it flipped now to, oh, I'm an HKS student, they were still willing to have the conversations, right? So there was so much information to be learned. Um, I don't know why, but I kind of thought that there would have been some kind of, you know, not, I don't want to say barriers, but some kind of pushback a little bit and, and, and reluctance to be so open and sharing when it comes to certain information. But it was actually quite the opposite, um, which was really good because that was really pertinent um, in us being able to get the information that we needed to be able to utilize it, um, you know, to take the steps forward, for the steps forward that we did. So people were really cooperative um, at all levels, to be, you know, quite frank. Um, this was at the city level, um, the officials, you know, the, 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 the different um, child care facilities, you name it. Um, they were they're very open to share with us. So that shocked me, um, but in a good way. I'll jump right on that point because I was also going to say that um, uh, talking to people um, was what surprised me. It kind of was a little bit daunting that we had it on our assignment every week to talk to someone new. I'm like, I'm running out of people to talk to, but that wasn't the case at all. There were all, there was always someone new to talk to and just like the, how long, how far these connections go kind of is totally amazing and the spaces that we were able to get into and learn from. Um, and the other point that I wanted to talk about was we, we realized that we weren't experts going in and we're probably weren't going to be experts coming out of, of this process. And um, there was a kind of like uh, defeated mentality at first where I'm like, I'm probably not gonna be able to really grasp the depth of this, all these problems, especially how um, it's really, as we mentioned earlier, systemic racism was part of it. And it was kind of uh, a little bit of pretentious of us to be like, we can note everything from far away on Zoom, especially um, this year. But we've also been told it's been done like this in the past year, so that kind of helped. But talking to people, learning from the context, doing the work that PDIA demands from us um, in order to be grounded in the locality, that really helped. And um, surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly, we were able to learn a lot and put out some really actionable steps that hopefully, Kevin, um, you'll be able to apply. Um, so uh, that was really surprising. That's actually a, uh, a really great segue into sort of what I wanted to touch on. One of my main learning, uh, one of my main elements of learning from this is that people are not comfortable I shouldn't say, I shouldn't be that general. A lot of staffers at government agencies are not comfortable talking through something new when you're trying to get them to sort of understand there are, there are needs not being met. They're not comfortable with it because they're, they've either spent so much time working on it or they are like, why are you intruding into my space? There's not a whole lot of interest in collaborating, especially when you're trying to say, we're trying to do something new. We're trying to find a new way of doing this. So I encountered that even in my own city. When I, when I started talking with 
with people about the um, about the findings of the team, about the, the findings of the, and their presentation, people were like, "Well, I don't, know. you know, I got responses from staff members that were like, well, I don't know how they got to this conclusion." I'm like, well, they got to this conclusion because they literally talked to everybody, and they went in the whole community. So you might not be at this conclusion because maybe you haven't talked to all these people, or maybe you haven't thought about it this way. So I even I don't want to say I had to do some. There was no damage control that needed to be done, but I definitely had to say, listen, they're they're here trying to help showcase ways that like we can do something new. And they've they've talked to all these people, they've learned all these new things. So one of the, the main the main learning objective I've had is that you can't take you can't take it personally when someone is defensive about you wanting to try to do something new and try to do something different. I at, at the beginning I did. And at the beginning, I thought, oh, wow, I'm going to have a really tough time um, getting what I want done if this person doesn't even want to talk to me. But now I'm like, we're not too bad, right? Like we're trying to we're trying to solve a problem. We're trying to fix. We're trying to uh, find solutions to issues that need fixing. And so um, that was my biggest takeaway. And and sort of from my own PDIA experience and then mixed with working with the team, like this is how I do things now. And it is different than what people are used to. And so like even at council meetings when you, I'm on the on the dais, well, on the Zoom dais, and most the other council members are just sort of speaking from the heart or have nothing prepared or like are not asking learning questions. I'm like, yeah, can I take an additional 10 minutes, please? <laughs> ask questions um and, I, and, and people just aren't used to it so um maybe if we can get everyone pdia trained and then infiltrated in every level of government in the world um things things will go better <laughs> thank you um and now i would like to open for questions if you would like to ask a question if you could use the hand raise function in zoom Katya, do you want to start us off? Sure. Thanks, Salima. And thank you to the team um, for your presentation and for all the work that you've done. It's a super interesting topic. Um, and I think quite timely as well. And as you were presenting, you know, COVID-19 was in the back of my mind. I think it shined a spotlight on childcare um, that maybe wasn't there before. Um, and so I'm wondering how that might have impacted some of your findings, if it came up in conversations, um, and how you managed the pandemic aspect of uh, this project. I can, uh, I can start to speak to that. Um, all I've been thinking about is recovery, just sort of generally. And when I did PDIA, it was right at the beginning of the pandemic. So I was in I was in the PDIA class that was last year started in May, April, May. So we were right at the beginning of the pandemic and it was the second PDIA class ever. And we were like, okay, so now we're doing this in, a, in this world situation. So that was, that was already sort of how I was framing my mindset when I was trying to figure this out policy-wise. All, all I heard, everyone I talked to is, COVID makes this a necessity. This is so important. This shows that it's not only a necessity, but it's a necessity for working people and trying to find ways to make it culturally appropriate and financially accessible were the two main things. But then I heard over and over again, what are the, what is the supply and demand requirements? What is, what is the supply requested? What is the demand requested? And people, people would ask me that and say, sure, I can get on board if you can show me if this is really demanded and how people can really do, make a supply for it. So that's what I would say, because COVID made everyone start thinking in those terms of what could be accessibly financial, financially, accessible financially um, at the time of a global pandemic. Um, one thing I will I, I would add as we were talking about, thinking about COVID is because this is hopefully a once in a lifetime type of experience. It was the idea of not getting, of getting caught up in a response to COVID, but really trying to think about this and what are the solutions that you would be putting into place that would be sustainable after COVID. So after everybody, you know, after kids go back to school and that the people who are maybe clamoring for childcare now aren't clamoring for it because they actually have somewhere to store their children, 
um, for during during the during the the waking hours? Um, how do you actually keep other people engaged in the conversation so it doesn't just go back into a condition? So I think when we were talking, it was just being con trying to be conscious of the fact that it has to be sustainable. It has to outlive COVID. Um, and use the opportunity that COVID provides um, in terms of how you might operate and, uh, you know, like the, the additional funds that, can, that are going to come in maybe to kickstart something that you could build on um, once those dollars aren't there again. Um, last, I just want to add very quickly to that. Um, I think another aspect was thinking about the financial impact of COVID um, on, on obviously on families, like in terms of who actually will need that childcare in the future versus who won't um, for various reasons. So we're thinking about, you know, obviously looking at things, unfortunately, like job loss. Um, and if there will be that need for the childcare, if, if, if you know, they're without a job, for example. Um, and as additionally, as some of those persons may be going in, back into the workforce, but in different types of jobs, how that need will shift. So maybe you were working full-time before, now you're working part-time. How does that adjust your need? Are you gonna need full-time care versus part-time care, et cetera? So I, I, I think for me, um, like I heavily focused on that financial aspect of it um, and how that actually changes, um, you know, now from now versus, you know, hopefully we start to see some, some brighter light down the future um, after COVID. Great, thank you. Uh, Adnan, welcome thank you, to- uh, Thank you, the group, uh, uh, for a very insightful presentation. So I had a quick question. Um, how did you deal with the skepticism that is often there regarding the process? Like, why are we doing this? We already know the solutions. We just need to implement it. This takes so long. <laughs> so any uh, lessons that you learned from that experience? Or how, to, to, how to deal with it? How did I deal with it? Um, a lot of prayer at night. Um, hmm. I dealt with it. By, um, I dealt with it by keeping open communication, right? Like people don't, people don't take you seriously if you send one email and have one meeting and then say, bye, see you later. Like it is a continuous relationship building process. I think, I think some of the best elected officials I know in the area are the ones that are following up with me and asking me questions about, Hey, what's going on in Burien? What do you need? Tell me about the landscape, right? Like, and that's one thing I learned after this group wrapped up was that I said to myself, I'm, you know, COVID ruined that and made it so difficult. But then when this group wrapped up, I said to myself, wow, I, I need to keep doing that. I, I need to try harder even during COVID, like whether it's a Zoom or a phone call, it still needs to happen. So I would say the answer is um, follow up. An actual, an actual continuous engagement, relationship building. Um, that way too, you can cut through the political rhetoric and the grandstanding and get to, get to work on actual issues. Because for the most part, the bureaucrats who are in the government offices and organizations, they're the ones that are just, that are just doing the work. They're doing all the, they're doing all the um, legwork for policy that gets implemented. So you got to get on their level. Thank you. Wonderful. That actually brings us to the end of the hour. Matt, did you want to have any final comments? Um, I, I, yeah, I like uh, Kevin. The, the the prayer is good. Um, I think uh, I, I think it is interesting, though. You know that I think part of this is also just honestly engaging with people and engaging with them uh, it, it, again and again and I, I do find that you need you need an example to them that this can work and that you can learn from it but you need to also create that opening where people want to learn and i think that that's what you're basically saying to people is is there's an opportunity here to learn we're doing something that's a little bit different but we're going to learn and, and I think people like learning, but I don't think people are used to learning being a part of their job. And so you almost need to create that narrative and kind of bring them into that space to say, we're doing something a little bit different here. I think the thing about timing though, is that this was really short. 
And so I think there was a fair amount of kind of really, really aggressive work here as well. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it is a very interesting um, organizational culture issue to kind of bring people into a learning journey. But I think you guys were amazing. And, and once again, thank you all for, for just uh, doing such wonderful work. It's great to have worked with everybody. Thank you, Salima. For great, thank you very much uh, to our student team who worked really hard for seven weeks and not all in the same place, you know, doing this, we usually teach this in a class where the students are in person. We had to do this virtually and Patty is in Bangkok. So they weren't even in the same country. We're talking about people around the world working on issues in the West Coast. And thank you to Kevin, who was actually up at 5 a.m. for meetings with his student teams on a weekly basis. And that is real commitment. Um, from you to work with our students and they have learned so much through this process and thank you very much for for all of your time and and as Matt said for giving this process of PDIA a chance in terms of learning about it. Um, our next event will be held next Tuesday May 11th at noon eastern time and the topic will be legal education reform in the Ukraine. Thank you very much for joining us and have a wonderful day. Thank you all. Thank you, Kevin.